Today's session is Exploring the Civil Rights Movement Using Interactive Game-Based Learning. Um, my name is Michelle Chen. I'm going to be moderating. I want to start by quickly introducing uh, myself and all of our presenters for today. So again, I'm Michelle Chen. Um, I'm a senior producer for kids, media, and education at the WNET Group, um, which includes all of the PBS stations in the New York City area. And I work on a range of educational media projects for public TV and digital platforms for kids of all different ages, including, of course, Mission US, which we'll be talking about today. Um, and we have three amazing presenters with us today. Um, first, we have Lily Exantis. She's the program coordinator for the District of Columbia Public Schools, where her work includes the design and implementation of the district's new teacher network. Uh, a professional learning community for new teachers. And she's also a former US history teacher and she's used many of the Mission US games with her students in the classroom. Uh, next, we have Dr. Charity Brown Griffin. Um, she's an associate professor in the Department of Psychological Sciences at Winston-Salem State University um, and director of the Minority Academic Achievement and Development Lab, as well as a licensed psychologist. Um, and Dr. Griffin's research examines cultural and contextual factors that contribute to Black youth development. Um, and last but not least, we have Pamela Walker. Um, Dr. Walker is an assistant professor of history at Texas A&M San Antonio. Um, Dr. Walker received her PhD in African American and women's history from Rutgers University. And her research has focused on the role of black and white women who organized to combat hunger and support the Mississippi Freedom Movement. Um, all three of our presenters um, have served as advisors on Mission US and specifically the development of Mission US No Turning Back. Um, and we're delighted they were able to join us today. Um, so today we're here to talk about Mission US and our new game, No Turning Back. Um, a quick preview of what we have planned today. We're gonna provide an overview of Mission US and our new mission about the civil rights movement. Um, we're gonna review the game's historical context and cultural significance. Um, we'll introduce strategies for classroom integration. And finally, we'll have time for a roundtable discussion and Q&A um, to answer all of your questions, or at least some of them. Um, so let's get started. Um, Mission US, for those who don't know, is our award-winning game series. It was developed to engage young people in transformational moments in American history. It's designed for middle school students and Mission US aims to get students to care about history by seeing it through the eyes of peers from the past. Um, in each game, players take on the role of a young person at a pivotal time as they meet historic figures, they witness key events, grapple with multiple perspectives, and experience the consequences of their choices. Um, in doing so, they practice perspective taking and develop historical empathy. Um, they also learn key vocabulary along the way and interact with primary, resource, primary sources in the games. Um, since 2010, we've launched six games in eras ranging from the American Revolution to westward expansion, the Great Depression, World War II, and more. Um, and each game is accompanied by a comprehensive educator guide. Um, to date, over three and a half million students and 120,000 teachers have used the games in all 50 states and beyond. Um, and now we're gonna take a look at a video overview of Mission US. So let's have the first video. Mission US is an award-winning educational media project that immerses young people in pivotal moments in US history. In each interactive mission, players take on the role of a young person and explore key events, meet historical figures, grapple with different perspectives, and make choices that help to illuminate the past. More than 3 million students and 100,000 teachers across the country have used Mission US. I like the game because it's like you're under the skin of that person and you're living those memories. Playing a game helps you to actually put yourself in the character's shoes. You're responsible for your actions and you get to see the reactions, what would happen as a result. A textbook doesn't do that. A textbook doesn't help you to relate to other people's experiences. Many students graduate from school without a deep understanding of our nation's history or the skills needed to study it. Mission US was created to address this critical need. 
multiple research studies have shown that playing Mission U.S. improves historical knowledge and skills, leads to deeper student engagement, and promotes richer classroom discussion. In one study, students using Mission U.S. showed a 14.9% gain in history knowledge compared to less than 1% among other students. Mission U.S. highlights the role of ordinary people in our nation's history. I don't miss the Jim Crow hospitality. And includes the voices of those who are often ignored or marginalized by traditional accounts. Lily and I are Nisei. We're Japanese Americans born in the United States. <laughs> Each game is grounded in extensive research, primary source materials, and input from historians, educators, students, and members of the communities that are portrayed. A core set of ethical design principles informs the development of learning experiences that are appropriate for our users. These principles were developed with input from teachers, students, and experts in culturally responsive education, youth development, game design, and other areas. I was very honored to be a part of Mission U.S. and to be behind the scenes. It gave me a sense of confidence knowing that my voice was heard and that they took very seriously the things that they were putting into the context of this game. To ensure broad access, the Mission U.S. games are available for free and designed for a wide range of learners and instructional settings. The website also provides free curricular supports to help educators use the games in their classrooms. I see Mission US as a jumping off point for all students. Some of them are very visual learners, some can't read very well, and by playing the games from the beginning to the end, everyone is able to get something out of the game. They're able to bring something to our conversations, they're able to bring something to our class. I would recommend Mission US to other teachers because it will help them help their students bring historical events to life. Some of our best ways of learning life comes from the experiences that others have to go through. What this game does is it just gives us a small glimpse, a small glimmer of what was taking place. And then it adds to that by teaching us and showing us ways that we can never and should never forget history. Mission U.S. truly allows students to become a part of the history. For a teacher, you can't hope for better than that. Learn more at missionus.org. Um, so that was a look at Mission U.S. Um, and today, we're excited to introduce our new mission. It's called No Turning Back. Um, it's focused on the 1960s civil rights movement. Um, players step into the role of Verna Baker, a fictional black teenager in 1960s Mississippi. Um, and as Verna moves to the city of Greenwood to attend high school, players will learn about the challenges of life under segregation in the Jim Crow South, um, as well as ways that members of the black community supported each other. And eventually players join the growing movement of young people organizing for voting rights. Um, the game highlights the important role that young people played in bringing about change. Um, and now we're going to play a short video um, to give you a look at No Turning Back. The year is 1960. You are Verna Baker, a 16-year-old born and raised in the Mississippi Delta. Law here says separate but equal. In the city of Greenwood, a movement for civil rights is gaining momentum. Well, I heard about some civil rights groups that are doing lunch counter sit-ins. How will you take part in the struggle for freedom and equality? We need young people like you to bring your light to our movement. Mission U.S., an interactive way to learn history. So No Turning Back was a team effort involving numerous partners and advisors, including historical scholars, civil rights activists, and community members from Mississippi youth development experts, as well as teachers and students. Um, and again, we're fortunate to have three of our advisors here today to share more about the historical and cultural context around the new mission, as well as some best practices for integrating interactives like Mission US into the classroom. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Pamela Walker, who was one of our lead content advisors on No Turning Back. Pamela. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Michelle mentioned earlier, I'm an assistant professor of history at Texas A&M San Antonio. I study Black women's history and African-American history. Um, 
And I'm really excited to be here with you all this afternoon. I'm going to be offering a little bit about the historical context for the game um, and kind of situate you within some of the sources of the game and then talk a little bit about historical language. And so first, the game, um, the start of the game really offers a bit about the kind of prehistory of the civil rights movement. You get a sense of um, the world and situating us within Jim Crow, Mississippi um, during the prologue of the game. Um, but to give you a greater sense um, about what this world was like, um, the Mississippi Delta is where we're situated within the game, which is about 50 to 70 percent African-American. Um, but this kind of system and regime that African-Americans lived under um, was a system of systemic discrimination and equality um, that denied African-Americans in Mississippi and in the Delta civil rights and human rights. Jim Crow was the system of denial and limitation. Um, Blacks were denied access to a number of things, including um, adequate education, access to food, and, and um, access to, uh, to, to work, um, to suitable labor. Um, and so I'll talk briefly about a few of those things because we are introduced to those aspects through the, through the world of, of Verna and her family members um, that we get a little bit of their history at the start of the game. So ed education is a critical component that we're introduced to. Schools in the Delta were poorly outfitted with books, structurally insufficient. A part of the reason why Verna is making this transition um, is to attend a better school um, in the city of Greenwood. Um, but these schools um, in many parts of the Delta um, often terminated education at ninth grade. Um, education for other students was often terminated much earlier for some children because they were obligated to work in the cotton fields of Mississippi. Um, access to food and food is a critical part of this story. Um, the Delta is known for, in many cases, its extreme poverty. Um, even though many Black families in Mississippi had small subsistence gardens, a large percent of Black Mississippians relied on the Free Commodities Program for Sustenance and Survival. This was a federal program that was implemented in Mississippi, but it was under the control of white administrators um, in the Delta who used um, control over access to this free food program um, to control African Americans and to um, discourage them for, from participation, per, participation within the movement. Um, another major aspect that we get kind of uh, glimmers of is this conversation around labor. Um, many African Americans around the turn of the century um, through the mid century were tenant farmers or sharecroppers. Um, by mid-century, mechanization um, is pushing uh, a lot of Black laborers out of this work. Um, the mechanization of the cotton industry um, pushed laborers, um, many of them off the plantation, um, and pushed them into deeper forms of poverty because there were limited labor opportunities um, in the Delta with the mechanization of the industry. So we get bits of this story through the, the story of, of Verna's family. But family and community are central components that we learn from the main character um, of this narrative. These networks are, become really crucial in kind of thinking about the ways um, that Black folks are building networks of activism and mutual aid um, uh, amidst this kind of system of oppression. And so throughout the game, there are a couple of components that become critical, thinking about Black beauty shops, businesses, and groups that become critical sites for organizing or something that the game does an excellent job of kind of making sure we're attentive to. Um, and these kind of alternative sites for organizing um, are really important because we often think about the Black church as being one of the central sites, but many Black churches were, were hesitant to engage in the movement in visible and public ways because of the reprisals that they faced. Um, through the game, we're also so introduced to important figures like Megar Evers, um, who was doing work prior to the 1960s in the Mississippi Delta, investigating the murders of um, Emmett Till and Clement Milton. And he also investigated these instances of discrimination at food distribution. And so Werner encounters these 
historical figures, real historical figures, and um, because inspired by this activism and inspired to join the youth movement. Another aspect that um, is kind of important contextually is this um, this kind of generation, this Emmett Till generation that Verna is a part of. Um, when Emmett Till is killed, many um, young activists are um, around his age um, in 1955. But when they come of age in the late 50s and early 60s um, and are 16, 17, 18 years old, um, they are inspired to lead a youth movement. They are some of the folks who are leading the sit-ins across the country who are participating in the Freedom Rides, who found these organizations like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which arrives in Mississippi in 1961. And so this is the kind of cultural context, the kind of social context that we're situated in within this game and that we engage with um, within this game as well. Um, what's really important, I think, is to consider truly the, the, um, the historical sources that drive No Turning Back. I think it's um, clear that history education in many spaces is, is under attack. And so I think engaging with primary sources um, allows us to point directly to the materials that we're using to build this narrative. This narrative centers the Black experience um, and specifically the experience of Black youth in Mississippi and the intergenerational connections that they forge. But this is not a reimagining of history. Um, it uses real historical sources to draw the narrative, historical actors, and kind of composite figures of ordinary people and participants to tell this story. So we use primary sources, memoir, oral histories are primary and significant drivers of this, of this game um, that build the world in which the characters inhabit. But we also have flyers, maps, memos, photographs, um, and documents from organizations like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which fought for freedom. And we introduce materials from those who resisted the movement, like the White Citizens Council. All of these materials are included for your students to work with and wrestle with. So hi history educators were consulted and engaged with this work and, in and introduced many of these primary sources. But we encourage teachers to use the resources included here, but also seek out additional resources that your students might be interested in um, using a number of the links that we've, we've provided from the Libra Library of Congress and other online sources. Um, finally, I'll just talk briefly about historical terminology and a note on language in the game. And I've written a more extensive blog on this that you can find on the website, but no Turning Back uses historical language when referring to race. None of the language in the game would be specifically um, considered racial slurs, but would be considered offensive to use today, these terms like colored or Negro. Um, the designers of the game No Turning Back made the choice not to use terms that would be anachronistic or out of place in the game. Many Black folks in the early 1960s were still um, proud of identifying as Negro. They capitalized the term as a sign of respect and dignity. The terms, however, colored and Negro were once acceptable, but they are no longer acceptable terms and have fallen out of fashion when referring to people of African descent. And so when discussing the game with your students and engaging with students, it's clear to kind of make those distinctions using the terms instead African-American or Black or Black person to describe the people engaging within the game. And so I would say it's important to have a conversation about language before you begin historical, any historical conversation about race, but especially before the game. Um, as a professor of African-American history, I do this every semester that I teach. And I think students often get confused about what's appropriate when discussing history and they're not intending to be malicious or ill intent. So having that conversation where you set the terms so that all the students in your class feel safe moving forward with this complicated um, and sensitive topic for some students, but it's important to kind of set the groundwork so that all students feel safe engaging in those discussions. And 
With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Brown Griffin. Thank you. So again, my name is Charity Griffin, um, and I'm an associate professor of psychological sciences at Winston-Salem State University, um, which is located in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And because my research um, and clinical work focuses on cultural and contextual factors um, impacting Black youth experiences, uh, particularly in the school setting, I want to take just a few minutes to spotlight um, the cultural significance of using no turning back, um, in particular for Black youth and other youth of color, um, and as well as for youth with having um, other identities as well. And so if we each just take a moment to think about um, significant periods of development in our lives, many of us would likely agree that the middle and high school years are pivotal, or this period of what we refer to as adolescence, um, is included in these critical periods. And so what do we know about adolescence? Um, we know that this period is crucial for developing identity and understanding the self. And so identity development is an important social emotional skill, often falling under this umbrella of self-awareness. And identity formation is really about contending with this question of who am I and developing a strong sense of self. And as you can see pictured here um, as an illustration, um, we have a multitude of identities, some which may be more salient or important than others um, at any given time or place. But what we know for Black youth in particular and other youth of color is that racial identity is an important aspect of development um, given the historical and contemporary politicization of race and racism experiences. And so, when we talk about racial and ethnic identity development, we're talking about this collective identity that's based on a perceived common heritage with a racial or an ethnic group. And it includes understanding how others perceive you in terms of your race and ethnicity and how you perceive yourself in terms um, of your racial group membership. And what is interesting is that racial identity is shaped by what we call in psychological and other research literatures, racial and ethnic socialization. And this may seem like a big term, but you all are socialization agents yourself. So we can think about socialization as how you shape and mold a child um, to understand um, different concepts. And so when we're talking about racial and ethnic socialization, we're talking about direct, explicit, unintentional, <clears throat> or even happenstance messages <clears throat> that children receive about uh, race, the existence of racism, and how to understand the way race operates in society. And again, these messages can be indirect or implicit or direct messages. And children often learn how to make meaning of race from a variety of sources. So typically caregivers such as parents or grandparents and extended kin are the first and most significant socializing agents um, for many children um, in terms of race during early development. But what we also know is that children navigate spaces external to the caregiver-child um, relationship. And so community becomes important for socializing um, students, and that includes schools, teachers, media. And so research in this area has made it clear that Black children in particular, um, as well as non-Black youth, receive various messages about race and what it means in our society. And the most significant of these messages are those that are most commonly delivered for Black children and other children of color, include those messages about race pride, teaching children about their history, their culture, their ethnic heritage, and also messages that promote um, or prepare them for bias that they may experience. So messages that teach them how to cope with uh, racial bias and racism in broader society. And so No Turning Back is a great example of useful racial socialization messages, right? And so No Turning Back can be used as a tool to promote these messages of pride about one's history and heritage um, amongst Black youth and provide insight also into the ways um, that uh, people coped um, with and navigated anti-Black racism. 
And so youth are able to see then firsthand in your classroom, not only how Verna is able to navigate these racial um, negative racial encounters, but we also gain insight into important aspects of her culture um, as a Black American. And these aspects shape her identity and give her much pride. And so I just want to make a note that despite some people's fear um, of discussing race and racism, particularly in educational spaces, given um, our ongoing sociopolitical climate, research has been clear that racial and ethnic socialization positively impacts children um, by promoting a sense of a positive self, promoting a sense of pride, and by providing um, helpful tools for facing racism experience racism experiences and um, instilling pride regarding one's culture, history, and heritage, which again for Black youth is particularly important because we've often seen throughout history and even present day that their culture and history is often erased or relegated to the margins. And so I want to end with saying that no turning back also involves much more um, than just depicting Verna's responses to experiences of oppression. And so think about how limiting would that be, right? And so I pose this question often to educators, what if the brilliance of Black students was at the center of the conversation of their learning and development? What if we thought about the brilliance of Black youth as axiomatic, which means self-evident or unquestionable? And so when we think about um, brilliance being perceived and regarded as axiomatic, Black children can be um, successfully seen as adaptive. Their success is inevitable. Um, the need for resilience promotion is shifted from the individual child to the system that does not promote their potential. And so I think it's important that instead of thinking about Black youth, um, a Black students, simply in terms of resilience, which is a response to something that is negative, or grit, perseverance through obstacles, that it's important to take this strengths-based approach that is reflected through no turning back um, when thinking about and framing Verna's experiences. And so an example of that would be going beyond just depicting the struggle um, that was endured, but also spotlighting the brilliance, as I mentioned, of the Black community's resistance, or in other words, their critical consciousness. And so critical consciousness is this ability to recognize and analyze systems of inequity and committing to take action against these systems. And we know that it's indeed critical for Black youth. Um, research in this area has demonstrated this, that it's associated with positive adjustment um, for Black youth. Um, but it's important for other youth as well, um, because it's about gaining knowledge about systems and structures that create and sustain inequity, which is this critical analysis piece. It's also about developing a sense of power, a capability, or a sense of agency. And then ultimately, it's about committing to take action against um, oppressive systems and conditions, which is this critical action piece. And so not just for Black youth, but for all students, we have seen that critical consciousness is associated with positive adjustment, including better mental health outcomes, school engagement, as well as actual academic performance and achievement. And so no turning back helps to facilitate this process by spotlighting the sense of agency acquired by the Black community in Mississippi and their brilliance exercised through critical action against racial injustice. And so I think No Turning Back is uniquely positioned to them moving beyond um, discussions of race um, and promoting positive racial identity to actually facilitating youth empowerment um, about social change. So now I'm going to turn it over to Lily, who is going to discuss strategies for classroom integration. Thank you, Charity, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm excited to be here with you. And before we dive in, I want to get a sense of your experience using an interactive game. And so we have a poll here. Um, that will pop up shortly. And um, it's rather simple, just asking how comfortable are you using an interactive game as part of your civil rights unit of instruction? Just give you guys a moment to respond. Okay, we're gonna stop here uh, just for the sake of time. Um, I see that 
there is <clears throat> a significant of you that are extremely comfortable around 39 percent as well as somewhat comfortable at 37 percent and we do have a few of us in the audience who are not as comfortable and i'm going to say thank you all for sharing um, your responses and i hope that after this webinar you are more comfortable um, and excited to use mission us and no turning back in your classroom So I am a former U.S. history and government teacher, and I've used Mission U.S. with middle school and high school students uh, since 2012. And all of Mission U.S. interactive games have the opportunity to deepen and transform the learning in your classroom. But before using any mission, but particularly this mission, I encourage you guys to ask yourself the following questions before you engage in this integration process. The first question is, do you have time to play the game and reflect first? You should play the game at least one month before you integrate it into your classroom. And as an advisory board member, I previewed the game and it took me significantly longer to complete because of the content and the context. And I wanted to give myself the time to really understand this from my lens as an African-American educator, as well as potentially what my students would also experience. So it's also was a good idea to get a sense of the challenges and topics presented in the game prior to exposing your students. And this will help you in planning learning experiences and extensions as well as conversations with your students and your families. The next question are what are your goals for use? So there are several sub questions for this. So what do you why do you want to expose your students to history in this way? Um, you know, in the past we have used um, history has been a bit dry, um, full transparency. Um, history was not my favorite subject in school, but as I've learned and explored, it's become a passion of mine, which led me to being a, a social studies educator. Um, in addition to that, how will this support your instructional goals? What do you hope for your students to get out of this game? All of these are questions you should consider before adding um, Mission US into your lesson plan. And a clear goal or purpose will help you advocate and plan. Number three. What is the political climate of your school and the community it serves? So let's be honest, teaching social studies right now, particularly US history, is challenging today than ever before. And from my home state of Florida, where we are actively um, attacking what social studies looks like in the classroom, it is very important to be cognizant of the environment in which you work and which you serve. So while we are facing these challenges and legislations, we are positioned um, to utilize a resource such as Mission U.S., but please take a moment to, again, consider how it's going to impact it, teach it in a transparent way so that you are cognizant of the impact it will have and you're able to mitigate any concerns. Number four. This is related to number three is, do you have time for a deep restorative and responsive conversation before, during, and after use? So the topics presented in No Turning Back are challenging and your students from every background deserve and need time to process. In the past, again, history has been taught through timelines and dates and events without the inclusion of real human experience. And Mission US brings the human experience to the center. And this change requires that we also adjust how we plan our instruction. So to continue with this thought process, you may ask, do you have the classroom community for such conversations? Have you created an environment that is inclusive, respectful, and reflective? And if you need support in ensuring your classroom community has what it needs, consider attending a workshop or training on using circles and restorative practice in your classroom to help build your community as well as utilize protocols to discuss challenging topics. The final question before you integrate Mission US into or no turning back into your classroom is, do you have local resources in your community to support and extend learning? 
So No Turning Back can provide the opportunity for you to connect with your local historical societies and continue to bring history to life in your classroom. When you connect with your local community, you can identify opportunities for collaboration, and this can help address resistance you may encounter, and again, as well, deepen the and extend the learning for your students. Now that we have considered the questions um, prior to integrating into the classroom, you're excited, there are some opportunities for integration. So when you're thinking about, I've prepared, I've played the game, where do I want to place no turning back into my learning or my lesson plan or my scope and sequence, there are many opportunities. You can use it to launch or conclude a unit of study, so to expand your students' understanding of the civil rights movement, as well as gain interest in the many stories within that time period. Um, as um, the presenters before me have spoken, there is a wide array of topics that individuals ranging from adolescents and teenagers to adults who, as everyday heroes, participated in this time period. And you can utilize no turning back to deepen that learning. You can also include it as a supplemental activity within a unit. So um, as somebody who practiced UDL or Universal Design for Learning, I had Mission US used as a choice assignment for my students. So I said, you know, we're gonna explore, for example, I used Mission 4, City of Immigrants. And I said, you know, we're gonna explore this. You can choose to play the game with us, or you can choose another activity to deepen your um, learning on our topic. A third opportunity for engagement is as an extracurricular after school club. So no turning back as well, it can connect you to ideas and topics within journalism, utilizing student government, as well as other organizations on your campus. So you're not obligated to keep this within the confines of your social studies classrooms. Definitely um, be creative and look for opportunities for cross-curricular engagement. The final opportunity um, for integration is a family engagement event. Um, as a educator that worked in a wraparound school with Title I um, services, we had opportunities to showcase our learning in the evenings for our families. So you can have a showcase night where you use this um, interactive game as well as any of the other missions within Mission US to demonstrate technology, social studies, as well as contemporary issues that you are engaging in your classroom. However you choose to integrate Mission as well, Mission US or as well as No Turning Back, the integration should be intentional, supportive, and responsive. And we're gonna break that down for you in just a moment. So the first part is intentional. And I did see a question in the chat about, is this accessible um, and uh, available uh, for Florida? And I think that when you are going to use No Turning Back, considering the political and social climate of the community that you serve, this resource is aligned to your state and school standards or district standards. And we've done a lot of the heavy lifting for you at Mission US. So No Turning Back is aligned to common core standards within literacy and history. They're also part of the C3 framework for a college career and civic life, as well as the national standards for history, basic education and partnership for 21st century skills. So we've prepared and aligned the uh, content as well as the instructional resources that we will have a moment in a few to preview to the standards that you are um, held to as social studies teachers in your classroom. Integrated with a purpose can take many forms. Um, you can use No Turning Back to support your civic duty unit as an example of youth activism. You can use it to discuss voting rights, the expansion as well as the limitations of the time period. You can use No Turning Back to support the civil rights movement as a whole and demonstrating how everyday people participated. The next, consideration when integrating no turning back is that a successful integration is supported and so this support can look like many can take sorry excuse me many different forms um one that i've utilized in the past and that has had great impact is using my colleagues and related content areas 
So within English language arts, um, we have created a cross-curricular unit where we explored persuasive writing um, for speech development. You can look into law studies and have the expansion of what it means to have laws passed and how that process looks. Looking into performing arts and how art shaped and spread the movement um, across the country. The second opportunity for supported integration is connecting to your national and local historical societies. And there, through the links that are on this page, the national and local historical societies have many resources um, for having conversations to deepen it, as well as connect to your local societies, professional learnings, and then also have opportunities for guest speakers. So you can bring that history even further to life. The last consideration is that successful integration is responsive. So I highly encourage you, and as educators, we are um, posed to listen to our students. Um, you may need to modify how the game is played. Now, you can play it in a whole group or in small groups with partners or individually. Think, think about who your students are, um, listen to how they respond and, and discuss the mission, and adjust accordingly. There's no wrong way to integrate Mission US, but you must consider the impact it has on your students and your classroom and your community. And as educators, we're often so excited um, about a lesson or a topic than our students are, and we can push them to an en engage when they're not able. So please you know, encourage you to respect the de your, their decisions and provide an alternative. As I've said, using universal design for learning and providing options um, for your students to engage in this topic as well as the mission, I think it's a great opportunity to give your students um, the, a sense of empowerment and guide their, their learning. So now that we have reviewed the mindset and instructional lens to best facilitate no turning back, I want to share a few educator resources that the Mission US team has created for you. Um, through their educator guide. And so what will happen, they'll drop a link in the chat that is to the website and it provides a look into the resources. We have a historical background with a primer that includes myths and misconceptions, their activities regarding document-based activities, vocabulary building, interactive maps, as well as many primary source documents that you can use um, to expand the learning with your students. So I encourage you to explore and use the resources that have been curated and prepared for you and your students. And we are now going to move to the Q&A portion of the webinar. I've seen lots of questions are popping up. So I'm going to pass it back to our moderator, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Lily, Charity, and Pamela, those were fabulous presentations, gave us a lot to think about. And um, I see we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, one of them is, um, how can we establish restorative and responsive relationships with children? Um, I'm wondering if maybe Charity, do you wanna take a stab at answering that one? Sure. Um... I think the first priority um, is listening um, and empowering youth um, to use their voice. Again, if we think about the middle and high school years, this is adolescence where youth are seeking to develop autonomy and they want to make decisions and they want their voices heard. And I think um, oftentimes um, as adults, while we do have wisdom, um, that we um, oftentimes put our own ideas and perceptions onto our students in our classroom spaces. And so if we want to build restorative relationships and make connections, um, we have to make sure we really lean um, into honoring and empowerment of youth voice um, and move away from adultism. And it's very difficult, um, particularly um, as Lily discussed in this socio and political climate where you have adults making policies that directly impact what children are learning in the classroom and what they're exposed to. 
But I think as much as possible, um, if you can center student voice, um, and there are different strategies um, for doing that. Um, I've seen teachers, I mean, doing things just like polling in classrooms, um, having writing prompts, submitting things anonymously um, to get feedback. Um, there's one strategy, um, if you would like to look it up, it's called Youth Participatory Action Research, where it's really about um, centering youth voice um, and having youth make decisions um, and identifying um, problems that they would like to collectively take action against. And so um, it's a really powerful tool for building agency and relationships with students in your classroom spaces. And I think No Turning Back does a, a great job of illustrating, um, again, um, the, the, the power of collectivism and that resistance piece, um, as I mentioned, and others as well. Thanks, Charity. And um, I don't know, Lily, did you want to add anything to Charity's, what Charity shared already? <laughs> no, I think those were great examples. I practice restorative circles um, with my students um, just to build community first before we dived into heavier topics as a bi-weekly schedule. So my students were already adjusted to that. And so when we dived deeper and had more challenging conversations, we had a space that was um, honest and pure for, to engage. So I think that's a really great tool to utilize. Great, thank you. Um, I see there was a question about what age range these lessons are, uh, these games are targeting. And I think it was answered in the chat, but just quickly that Mission Yes is designed for middle school students, but it can be scaled up or down. And we do know that some teachers in elementary school have used it with some scaffolding and teachers in high school have definitely used the games with their students like you have Lily. Um, so um, that's the answer to that question. Um, another question um, is, what is challenging about teaching the civil rights movement and how can an interactive resource like this help? Um, who would like to take that one? Um, I'm, I can. Lily, I can oh, oh, we have Pamela? Please go ahead, Pamela. <laughs> um, well, I, I can, speaking from like my perspective as a kind of university professor who like has, you know, has students after they come through their K-12 education, I think a lot of um, what they understand about the civil rights movement still seems to often be these kind of mainstream key political figures. Um, uh, Rosa Parks, you know, Martin Luther King, um, Malcolm X, like those are some of the kind of three big names. Um, and so I think some of the challenges often um, can be how do we actually um, help students understand that we have sure leaders within this movement, but this was a mass mobilization that was within uh, on the ground networks of community folks. Um, that were that also didn't just appear um, with the Montgomery bus boycott or appear um, with the sit-ins, but a lot of these this type of activism had legacies from the 1930s and are rooted in Black mutual aid groups and are rooted in kind of Black community um, organizations and formations, and so um, I think sometimes that history can be. Uh, less kind of sparkly than like talking about marches or talking about um, some of the other national things that come to mind. But the way that Mission US takes us through the kind of slow build of a movement within a community from the perspective of a young person who's connected intergenerationally, who had a grandfather who participated in um, uh, uh, black civil rights organizations and um, black empowerment groups, but also participated in mutual aid organizations for uh, the education of children in the Delta. I think drawing that thread of these lineages um, shows us that ordinary people were inspired within their uh, communities through those legacies and histories of activism that have gone overlooked because they weren't kind of on the mainstream news or in the papers. And so I think it's important, sure, to talk about the national movement and those mainstream issues, but that the local movement um, 
as something that everyone can connect to because there are different types of local movements that happen across the country that might look a lot like the type of activism that we see um, Berna participating in. Thank you, Pamela. Um, and um, I, I think Lily, it looked like you were about to say something before, so I didn't know if you wanted to add anything. <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay. Um, so I, I know I saw a question. Um, uh, oh, I see a new question actually that I did not see before. Is there a timeline of what you should teach first, civil rights movement or Juneteenth? Um, Lily, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I'm just, I, I feel like I would need a little bit more context because um, typically in K-12 education, there's like a scope, of se a, a sequence of when, you know, we cover things in kind of a linear passageway from, you know, um, like Manifest Destiny, Civil War, Juneteenth, Civil Rights Movement. So I, I would say that um, using the standards and curriculum provided by your district would help you and Mission US and No Turning Back is a supplement, deeper, richer expansion of what you can offer your students. Hope that answers the question. I don't know, Pamela, if you have for charity something to add in regards to that. No, I think that was a, a great response. Um, but I think like like you said too, like going within the kind of standard scope and sequence that you would imagine. So temporally, um, Juneteenth being prior, but it's it's would be useful to kind of it's always helpful to kind of provide those broad timelines about movements to students that help students see um, sequentially how movements are born and then sometimes there's a low period and then how they're um, come back to the forefront again, so. Right, um, I know we have just a couple more minutes. Um, I saw questions about, you know, is this approved in Florida? And I know that the three of you have touched on this question of, you know, the current educational political landscape, but I, I wondered if you had any additional advice or, you know, what you would say to teachers who are concerned about using a resource like this in our current climate. Um, I don't know, maybe we can hear from each of you. Do you want to start, Charity? Sure. Um, I think Verna and her community gives us a great model, right, of resist what resistance looks like. Um, and I think that um, there are many multiple ways um, to speak truth to power, and that truth is um, not erasing history and spotlighting the significance um, of Black history in particular. Um, as we think about the preeminence of anti-Black racism and the erasure of Black history, uh, particularly in public education, that is important to speak to our policyholders, uh, policymakers, district leaders, school administration um, about what we want to teach. And um, I know teachers are uniquely positioned, right, where you do have this pacing guide and you do have these standards and you have the reality of having to do your job. Um, but I think perhaps um, even uh, connecting with what I mentioned earlier about centering youth voice, um, if youth and students in your classroom are saying they want to learn about these topics, Right. They want um, to take a deeper dive into understanding their own identity. Collect that data, present it to your school boards, present it to your your school admins, um, get access to empirical articles that I mentioned and others have mentioned that talks about the benefits of learning um, about um, race, history, and culture within learning spaces, and what does it do for mental health, positive identity development, and also academic achievement. And so I think, again, presenting this information to leaders is a an initial start for helping to organize around resisting uh, what may be the, the pushback that you may get um, when trying to take a deep dive using um, curriculum materials such as this. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just add and say, and I, I mentioned this in the presentation, but I'll um, just restate it here that um, similar to what uh, Charity is saying that, you know, this is a, a story about youth activism, 
Um, it, it is not a revision of history. It is not rewriting history. It is simply a story that centers the Black experience. Um, it centers the activism of Black youth. Um, and there are primary source documents um, that the um, game designers um, and other folks, historians who have been consultant to help build this game and design the game. So um, the story is truthful in that primary sources have been consulted um, and that it is history that has been overlooked, um, but it's not a revision of history. Um, and so I would just say that and use those sources in your classroom, engage with those materials um, uh, as, a, as a way to kind of um, respond to folks who are saying that this is a, a revision. And there are, if, if you will say that both perspectives are included, the White Citizens Council's materials are included in the game as well as those folks who um, fought back against um, the, those types of oppression. And so we have materials that represent the dynamic situation that was happening on the ground. Thank you so much, Pamela and Jody. Lily, I don't know if you have like 15 seconds because we, we have about a minute left, but. Um. Uh, yes, I would say um, to both their points, definitely utilize the materials and be transparent and honest. Share with your students what you're trying to accomplish, get their voice, share with your families so that they're aware of what you're trying to accomplish. I think being honest about this topic and this conversation in the game um, will mitigate a lot of those concerns. Well, thank you again. Um, just want to give a quick shout out to the WNET group. That's where I'm from and we're the organization behind Mission US. Um, and we, our kids media and education group produces a range of innovative media um, for children and youth. Uh, you'll see some of our projects here on the slide. Um, as well as resources for families and educators, including a wealth of media-based resources for the classroom on PBS Learning Media, which we hope you'll check out. Um, also, a quick thank you to all of our funders um, who make Mission US possible. Um, and here's where you'll find Mission US, uh, the website, our Facebook and Twitter, and our email if you have any questions. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you to all the presenters um, for this discussion. And um, we hope that you'll check out the game and you know, contact us with any questions.